We're in the Gospel of Mark, um, or the Gospel according to Mark. And we're going to look at what the word gospel means um, later on today. But I wanted to just do a real quick intro um, and, and to talk about uh, four things. Um, you know, who was Mark? Um, some people believe it was John Mark. We'll look at him. Uh, the source of his gospel, like where did he get the information? Because he was not a first-hand participant in, in this. And, and generally in the New Testament, for a, for a New Testament book to be included, they had to be first-hand witnesses. Apostle with a capital A. <laughs> Um, you know, they, they had to see Jesus' life, um, you know, and participate with him and see his resurrection. That was how you qualified to be an apostle. You saw that in the beginning of Acts when they were looking for the replacement um, apostle. And uh, so, so how did it get included? Because you'd have to know well, who he is, where, where's his source, where did that information come from uh, for it to be included in the New Testament and into the canon. Then why did he write the gospel and just an overview of the gospel? So who was Mark? Um, you can read the book of Mark and not find him say, hi, I'm Mark, <laughs> and I'm writing this book. So it's considered an anonymous book, um, and, but it's called Mark, and there's a reason for that. But um, how do we know that it was him who wrote it? Uh, really, with 100% certainty, we don't. Um, however, the early church fathers, quite a few of them, um, said that they heard directly from John, the apostle, and from others that it was Mark who wrote it. And Mark was a, um, um, it's specifically John Mark, who was a cousin of uh, Barnabas. You know, you, does that ring a bell? So remember Is that Peter. Is the book of Acts where, where it talks about him? What's that? Does the book of Acts talk about John Mark? It does. It does. In fact, it doesn't say John Mark, but it says it's the cousin of Barnabas, John, who, or Mark, who's also known as John. And so that's why people call him John Mark to kind okay. of a lot of Johns in the New Testament, right. and so he's John Mark, uh, but we, we call him Mark. Um, so he believed that he was a cousin of, well, we know he was a cousin of Barnabas. Um, it says in, let's see, uh, Colossians actually, Colossians 4.10, um, it says Mark, the cousin of Barnabas. It calls, calls him out and says that he was his cousin. And remember, Barnabas was the one who traveled with, uh, with Paul and with Peter. Paul and Barnabas traveled and uh, if you remember, Mark also traveled with Paul, um, but in his immaturity, he was probably fairly young, he kind of left in the middle of the journey. So uh, we don't know why. Um, it could have been, this is too tough, or I don't want to do this, or there's some things I need to do at home. We don't really know. But he left, and Paul was really, uh, really upset about that because later on, when Mark wanted to go with Paul again, um, it was Barnabas that says, we're going to take Mark, his cousin, right? And, and Paul says, absolutely not. And so they split and went their own ways. Uh, there was a split in the missionary journeys, and Barnabas took uh, Mark, and Paul, I um, can't remember, I think he took Silas, didn't he? Because he took somebody with him. Yeah, he took Silas. Um, he took Silas. Yeah. And didn't God use that, though, to spread the gospel even Did. more? <laughs> Did. <laughs> to different areas? Um, so Paul called him, he said he deserted him. Yeah. Uh, that's how he described it during the missionary journeys. Um, he later matured, we believe, and Paul wrote to the Colossians that Mark, um, that if Mark came, they were to welcome him. Um, he listed Mark as his fellow worker in Philemon. Um, and Paul instructed Timothy to get Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful to me for ministry. So you see there was a uh, healing of that relationship. Um, and then Peter, in 1 Peter 5.13, when we were in the book, uh, it says Mark, Mark is called his son. Peter calls him his son. Uh, could have been son in the faith, could be uh, just the spiritual, spiritual son. Um, and some suspect that Mark shows up in his own gospel in um, 14, uh, 51 through 52. And you probably remember this story. That's where it's in the Garden of Gethsemane, and they're arresting Jesus, mm -hmm. and all the disciples ran. But there's this really strange story about this guy um, who's dressed in basically a sheet, not clothes, but a sheet. And the Roman guards try to grab him, and he lets the sheet go and runs away naked. 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 <laughs> Could have been with a loincloth, most likely, but, but, he, but he ran away. And it just is these two verses in 51 and 52 of chapter 14. And that's a really odd story. It only shows up in Mark. And it's kind of a personal story. Like, why in the world would you add that? It doesn't really add anything to this story, but uh, it just, so some people suspect that was him. Because that's a very personal story. It doesn't show up anywhere else. So it could have been him, is what, is what they were thinking. Um, mm -hmm. there, is, there is some tradition that well, we know that he was the son of a very wealthy uh, merchant. And so <coughs> there's speculation that the Garden of Gethsemane was actually owned by his mom, 
Mary was was her name, not that Mary, another Mary, a very wealthy Mary who supported Jesus. I don't know if you know this, but Jesus had several women supporters who were very wealthy. One was like who ran the household of Herod. She was very wealthy. There's Mary who was also very wealthy, but they suspect that maybe Mary actually owned that because Gethsemane means olive press. That's all it means. I guess Garden of Gethsemane was a garden of the olive press. And um, so it, it could have been that he was one of the guards in the evening um, and that that's why he came out. He heard the commotion and that's all speculation, but uh, it's interesting Tr- tradition. These kinds of traditions I think are fun to listen to, but the, you know, I would just write them down in pencil, not in pen in your notes, because we don't know that for sure. Um, so what was the source? Oh, 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 lastly, he was not an eyewitness of Jesus' ministry. So he wasn't a disciple that followed him. Um, he would have known of Jesus, obviously, because of what had happened. Plus, um, you know, with, uh, with Peter and uh, Barnabas and uh, being the cousin of Barnabas and this and that, he probably knew a lot about Jesus, but he didn't follow him. Um, and he wasn't an apostle, which means that he wasn't there from the beginning and didn't see Jesus raise, r- rise from the dead. He didn't see his risen body um, that, that we know of. Um, he may have seen one and not had the other or had one and not the other, but he didn't have both because he wasn't in the list of people they could have uh, pulled in. Um, so what was his source? Since he was an eyewitness, why did he get included in the, uh, in the New Testament? Um, he was a very close companion to Peter, um, and he traveled with Peter quite a bit. Um, and he probably heard Peter tell of his stories um, and heard him preach for years. Um, and uh, most believe that he was in Rome when Peter was crucified. Remember, he was crucified upside down. And uh, um, that Mark was there, and most believe that Mark actually was the very first gospel that was penned. And that Matthew and Luke, when they wrote their gospel, that they had access to read Mark. And so you see the structure of Mark show up similarly in Matthew and, uh, and Luke. And those are called the synoptic gospels, which are like kind of, they, they follow the same kind of structure. John is different. <laughs> it's kind of more mystical, but, but Matthew, Mark, and Luke uh, follow the synoptic gospels. And they, they likely had his. And so he might have written it right after Peter's death. Uh, between 50 and 60 AD. We don't know exactly when that was. Um, Some place a little bit later, but it was one of the first that were there. It was not the first um, book in the Bible um, that was written. Uh, Most, do you know which the first book of the Bible? It wasn't a gospel. Job. No, I don't mean the first, sorry, I said that wrong. The first book in the New Testament, (laughs) because you're right, Job was was the first, but in the New, it's 1 Corinthians. Mm-hmm. And uh, so many times when, and today we're having communion, and if pastor reads out of 1 Corinthians, the words of Jesus, that was the first recorded words of Jesus um, that's in the New Testament was 1 Corinthians, where Jesus says, take my body, do this in remembrance of me, that, that passage there, that that was the first recorded words of Jesus. Um, Mark likely was one of the, well, was the, probably the first gospel. Uh, but, but Peter was his source. So he traveled with Peter, he heard him. Uh, speak and uh, I can just imagine that Peter probably has some really good stories. Um, I would love to to interview Mark to tell us. Just I'd love to hear some of the stories of everybody. Want to talk to Peter first? So I'd probably go to Mark and try to get the stories of Mark because he was his traveling companion from a long time. Um, and if you read, if you read uh, even without being highfalutin scholars. Uh, you can take the sermon, uh, I think it's in chapter 4 of Acts, where Peter gives that sermon, and you look at the book of Mark, you can take the sermon and put, the, and put it as an outline over the book of Mark, and you can see the structure that Peter had in his sermon fit the book of Mark. Even some of the sayings, like, I bring you joyful tidings, that phrase shows up in, in Mark. Um, the immediately, which is one of his favorite words, real quickly, let's go, and he did this, and then this happened, and this happened. Yeah. And so you read Mark, and it's very action-oriented, which, from our reading, Peter is, was very action. Let's do this, let's do that. And, and so you can kind of see those, those parallels, even without seeing the testimony of the church father saying that Mark wrote it from Peter's account. So this is why, this is the source of Mark, was Peter. So when you're reading, even though um, Peter didn't write a gospel, um, he wrote epistles, two epistles that we have. Um, um, likely, this is firsthand account eyewitness from Peter. Because that's the one thing that <laughs> strikes me when I've read Mark compared to the other Gospels. It, it seems like it's a very linear thing, like, then this happened, then this happened. Just like you that's said, right. it's, it's, one of the things that stands out is very abbreviated and direct. Right, right. And, and that's, this is why it was included. Um, even though he wasn't a direct apostle, he, he was recording it from an apostle. And Luke also wasn't a, an apostle or a, um, or a um, um, 
a disciple, thank you. Uh, however, if you read the beginning of Luke, he says, I gather this from firsthand eyewitnesses. And he interviewed the apostles. He interviewed Mary. He interviewed some of these other people, got the, and collaborated and put this together in his historical account. Um, and really, Luke significantly impacts um, when it's just the volume of words, the New Testament. He wrote a good portion of the New Testament because Luke and Acts. You really could call it's first Luke and second Luke because they fit together, really. Uh, it's to the same person. And some people believe Luke and Acts were written as a defense because when you went before Caesar, if you appealed to Caesar, you had to write a background. So Caesar knew what was going on before you came before him. And some people believe that Luke and Acts were written to present to Caesar to see what was going on. It's very, um, it's very positive towards Romans um, and, and the Roman way of looking at things. Um, centurions are presented in a very positive light, tax collectors in a very positive light, unlike Matthew and other places. So anyway, just, just some background of the Gospels, but specifically Mark, the source came from Peter. Um, so why did he write the Gospel? He doesn't say for sure. It's not like in John, at the end of John, he says, I wrote this so you may believe. <laughs> he didn't give a, a purpose statement of why he wrote it. Um, but if you assume, because um, some of what I said, where he was in Rome and uh, about the time that Peter died, that was, uh, um, that was during the time of Nero and the burning of Rome and the persecution of Christians. And um, interestingly enough, um, the, uh, you know, when Rome burned, Nero at first um, said, well, this isn't, it wasn't me. And then he went out and had these, all these, uh, he was giving food to the poor and he was real building things and widening the streets and trying to do humanitarian aid, uh, aid out there. But then people still believe, well, he did it on purpose. And so that's when he went after, not the Christians in general, but Christians specific. So he went after some of the leaders and he brought the leaders in and he found out that was very popular and it distracted other people from focusing on him. And so he kept on doing that. And, you know, I mean, you know the stories and I don't need to go through all the gory details. Um, but if Mark was in Rome at this time, um, he would have been the eyewitness to the sufferings of the Christians. And the Christians who were suffering, um, one of the, um, during a time of distress like this, knowing the source of what you believe is very valuable <laughs> because you start questioning it. Well, well, it's persecution. And what I believe, is this true? Is this right? And Mark, um, in contrast to Matthew, um, Mark seems to write as a witness document. And that's, that's what it was called back then, of here are witnesses. And you see the witnesses show up at Jesus' witnesses to himself three different times. This is why I came. This is what I'm doing. Even the angel himself, uh, um, well, even the angel, uh, when he witnessed to Christ, being, he says, why are you here? He's not here, right? The stone has been ro rolled away. Why are you looking for him here? It's a first person witness account of what the angels saw and what they saw. So it's, when, when we go through Mark, just keep your eye out for that of looking for witnesses to what's happening. Eyewitnesses, not just, not just here's what I believe and here's what I think. Um, there's more focus on Jesus' actions in life than his teaching. There is teaching in Mark, but it's mostly actions and, um, and, um, and his life, the way he lived, the reason why he lived, witnessing to why he lived and what he did. Um, whereas in Matthew and, um, and Luke and John, you get a lot more of the teaching of Jesus. In Mark, you get the life of Jesus. Um, and so in contrast to Matthew, he really seemed, Mark seemed to write to a Roman audience. Um, for example, when he used Aramaic, Aramaic was the language that they spoke in Israel. Um, they didn't speak Greek. They read Greek, but they spoke Aramaic, right? And, um, but Romans would know Aramaic. So anytime there was an Aramaic term, like uh, when he spoke on the cross or other things like that, when he called daughter, and it's recorded in Aramaic in Matthew and Luke, in Mark, he interprets it to Greek or to Latin. And so it's a direct, he, he translates it to the Roman audience. And other places, like I said, he uses Latin terms instead of Greek terms. Um, he also measured time according to the Roman time. Whereas in Matthew and Luke, they go by the Jewish time of measuring time. Um, in, in Mark, it's watches. It's not the hours. They measure things in watches. They, you know, Jews measured it in hours. Um, he also took time to explain Jewish customs, which you wouldn't do if, if you're a Jew, you don't say, well, here's why we, if you're American, you don't tell another American, well, this is why we do this. And this, well, of course, everybody knows that that's part of our culture, right? But he explains it in a way as if the person doesn't understand the Jewish culture. And lastly, or a uh, last couple, he omitted uh, Jewish customs, uh, the Jewish custom to include the genealogies. 
So he doesn't have a genealogy in Mark, whereas to a Jewish audience, that would be super important. But to a Roman audience, well, that doesn't mean anything to me. Right? To a Jewish audience, the temple's still there. They could go and validate that. They could go and look this up and see the lineage that Matthew, in fact, Matthew probably did his research and found the lineage, and, and kept, but somebody could go and validate that. Same thing in Luke. They, they could validate what he said. It wasn't just, a, I'm just saying this, and it's not oral history. It's an actual record that you could go and reopen the scroll and see the lineage of Jesus. But to the Romans, they didn't have access to that, so why include it? And lastly, when telling the story, remember Simon the Cyrene? Remember when Jesus is carrying the, the cross beam, not the cross, but the cross beam to mm. on Golgotha? Remember, he collapsed, and, they, and the soldiers got... Um, Simon, or yeah, Simon of Simon of Cyrene. It's hard to say fast. Simon of Cyrene. Um, uh, he explains. It's explained. He's, he tells the story, um, and he believes that he told the story because he was a very prominent, or at least his son was a very prominent member of the Roman Church. Um, his name was Rufus, who was the son of Simon of Cyrene, who is mentioned in Mark, and so um, that was sort of evidence of, yeah, you remember, you know Rufus? Well, let me tell you the story about his dad, of what happened, and um, so he included that. So those are some evidences that was really written to a Roman audience, and I think they're pretty compelling evidences. So a real quick overview of Mark's the last of the four things here, of just an overview. Um, You've probably heard there are different portraits of Jesus. So you look at the Gospels and you think of portraits. So um, Matthew presents Jesus as a king, right? Um, and, and he focuses on that. Um, Luke presents Jesus as the son of man. Um, John presents Jesus as the word of God or the logos, um, which is, um, I won't get into it, but that was a super important thing philosophically to people who are intellectual in the Roman world. Logos was... It wasn't just creation. Logos was what created things. It was the moving of everything that happens in the world. And John says, I'm going to tell you uh, the Logos, and the Logos is a person of Jesus Christ. And that's when he starts off, but in beginning was the Logos, and the Logos was with God, and the Logos was God. That's, so he's kind of speaking to that philosophical bent. But uh, in Mark, he presents Jesus as a suffering servant. Um, you've probably heard these portraits before of the different Gospels. Um, however, I'm going to present Mark to you really as a document of witness. Um, the more I read Mark, the more I see this, and I read some different commentaries, and he kind of planted, one of the commentators planted this seed in my head, and, and I really like this, this idea of looking at it as it's a witness. This is a, this is a witness of what's happening, speaking to the people where they're having suffering happening to them. Let me tell you, I'm going to witness to what is true, what really happened, um, you know, first person perspective of what happened. And that would be very comforting to the, uh, the people of Rome who are going through persecution at the time. Um, so, so as we go through this, just keep an eye out for the eyewitnesses. Um, the, the, by the way, you know um, the word witness, you know where it comes from, the Greek word for witnesses? You're going to recognize the word, martyros. Mm -hmm. Martyr oh. is the word for witness. Mm -hmm. So when somebody's a martyr, they're witnessing. And, uh, and just think about that, of what they're witnessing to. Uh, because we use the word witness, and to us it's just a very simple thing. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to witness to, I'm going to go witness to wink. Right, and you think I'm just going to share the gospel, but in the Roman way of thinking, in the Jewish at that time, to witness to something was to give your life for something. It was a much more, much more sacrificial kind of thing, much more involved kind of thing than just going and telling something about something. It reminds me of an expression I heard saying, "Always be witnessing to people and sometimes use words." <laughs> yes, I, I have heard that, and um, uh, I heard a pastor once say. Um, always use words, because <laughs> because it's by it's by uh, it's by the mouth you confess the words that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and so unless you profess with because some some of my friends they, all they do is they live and they don't speak words. I'm like you have to speak words, you have to give your witness with words. So yeah, I I agree with that. I think that your your life should mirror what you're saying, but you definitely say something. So it's a both and. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Um, so the summary, uh, he, was a, he was a companion of Paul and Peter and a cousin of Barnabas. He wrote his gospel from the eyewitness of Peter. Um, the audience, um, I believe it's compelling that it was originally Roman. He presented Jesus as a suffering servant. The emphasis is on eyewitness accounts and focuses on deeds rather than teaching. Um, not that it doesn't focus on teaching, but the focus you'll see is deeds and life um, and teaching. He gives just enough teaching so you can see that it kind of corresponds, I think, with the life he's living 
And summary Mark is a document which gathers the witnesses of Jesus, the Son of God. Um, so that takes us to the first eight verses. Um, and let me just read that, and we'll dive right in and see how far we can get. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John appeared, baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached, saying, After me comes he who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, as we look at these words, we pray that through the ministry of the Holy Spirit that we would understand what these words say and they would make an impact in our spiritual walk so we can become more like your son. In your name, amen. So in verse one, I mean, really, Mark jumps in right into the story and skips over the birth and the early life of Jesus like you see in Luke and Matthew. Um, and he jumps right to the beginning. And... Um, it really uh, stood out to me that there's two other books that begin with in the beginning, uh, which is John and Genesis, Genesis right? Um, both of them talking about the beginning of time, right? Before creation happened. But here we see that it's um, uh, the beginning of the gospel story, beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now this word gospel, we there's, there's a lot of words, and I would challenge you to question some of the words you use in Christian, uh, I call them Christianese, it's sort of our way of speaking, and we use the word gospel for meaning lots of things. We, uh, uh, I just jotted down some things that came to my mind. Obviously, it's a book, the gospel of Matthew, the gospel of Mark, the gospel of Luke, uh, where it can be used as truth, right? You say, well, is that gospel? What you mean, is it true? Uh, but then also we have to emphasize, is that the gospel truth? <laughs> it's sort of, is that truth truth, or is that just truth? <laughs> it's kind of what you're saying. It's kind of how we use it. Um, uh, it can describe the teachings of a religious teacher. Um, and I just jot out the gospel of Fred. Well, that's the gospel according to Fred, or that's the gospel according to Wink. But that may not be true. That's his truth. That's not my truth. It's kind of how we, how we, and I've seen that kind of come up over the last, uh, I don't know, a decade or so. That, 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 that way of speaking is, um, well, that's good for you, but not good for me. That's your gospel. It's not my gospel, that, that sort of thing. But when reading the Bible, I think um, it's, it's nature that we read into and don't question that. Like we were just talking about evangel, you know, the word evangelicalism, right? That when I was growing up, it had a pretty defined meaning. And you knew that when somebody used that and described themselves as that, you knew what they believed. But that's definitely not the case anymore. When somebody calls himself an evangelical, that can mean lots of things. And to um, there's evidence of Peter, uh, is it Peter or anyway, Barna, um, does a lot of research. And he's found that evangelical really, to most of the people, means Republican and conservative. It doesn't have, have any spiritual connotation to it whatsoever. Now, for us, that seems silly because we use evangelical in a certain way. But when you're speaking to somebody that doesn't have a church background, which is a lot of people, they see a Republican's conservative. They don't understand what evangelical means. And so you can be using the term and thinking you know what you're communicating to them, but they're like, they're thinking something totally different, even though you're using the same words, right? And I'm using this as an example. When you read scripture, um, it's, it's important to take your time and say, well, what does that mean? And not only what does it mean, but what did it mean to the people who Mark is writing to? Because that was his intention. He didn't know all these other terminology. I mean, there was no gospel of Mark, right? There was no gospel of Matthew or gospel of John. So when he used gospel, what did he mean? I mean, I, I'm just challenging you to think about that. What, what did it mean? And so you can do a little digging and find out what it meant to their time by looking at how they use the word. And uh, the two examples that I found is one is Jewish and one is um, Roman. And in the Jewish, um, if you remember, the Old Testament was written in Hebrew. And about 350 years before Jesus was born, um, they, I can't remember who the leader was, but they, they paid for, I mean, it was very expensive. It took quite a few years, about 70 um, um, Jewish scholars to come together and interpret from Hebrew into Greek because Greek is what people read. They didn't read Hebrew. The common person didn't read Hebrew. So really, the scriptures at the time of Jesus was a translation. It wasn't the original. 
It was a translation of the original. So they, they read in Greek. Their Bibles were written in Greek. And it's very useful for us because we can go back to the Hebrew and know what that means. We can see how they interpret it into, into Greek and say, oh, that's what it meant at their time. And you can carry that forward and say, okay, that's what that word meant in their society and culture. You see how that, that's important. And it's called the Septuagint because Sept, I think, is 70. It was 70 scholars. So Septuagint was 70 scholars got together and they, they produce what's called the scriptures. And by the way, in the New Testament, anytime you see, as the scriptures say, it's all the Old Testament. It's uh, with, with one exception, it all meant the Old Testament. That's what the early church had was the Old Testament. They didn't have a lot of the stuff that we had in the early church. Now, as the church got older, they had more writings as we have, which look more like ours. But back then, scriptures, especially when Jesus was alive, it was all the Old Testament. And that was scripture. Um, anyway, so when they, they interpreted, uh, especially, um, and we're going to look at Isaiah 40, uh, but Isaiah 40, 9 through 10 reads like this. Go up on a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good news or gospel, herald of the gospel. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good news or gospel. Lift it up. Fear not. Say to the cities of Judah, behold, your God. In other words, here's God coming. Behold, he is coming. Behold, the Lord God comes with might and his arm rules for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his recompense before him. So the gospel is announcing that God is coming, that your king, your ruler is coming. That was the good news. The good news was rejoice because God is coming. Salvation is coming and he's going to come with his strong arm, with his recompense, which is you know, basically paying people back for what they've done, that, that sort of thing. Um, so you see here that it was announcing the coming of the king, um, a king which would bring reward, reward, rule, care, and power. So to a religious Jew, the gospel was the news that the king was coming would make all things right. That was what the gospel. So when you said the gospel, there's that, that technical meaning is what people carried with them. Um, now in the Roman time, the pagan word, um, the pagan saw this word gospel as announcing the news of a king coming. You see the theme here. In the 9th century BC, we have an inscription which announces the birth of Caesar Augustus, the Savior, is what it says in the inscription. It says, the beginning of good news for mankind is what the inscription says, um, who will bring salvation. So this idea of a king is coming that will bring salvation. So this idea of gospel meant that the king is coming and salvation is coming with him. So that's what gospel meant. So when Mark starts off the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, He's following that cultural way of communicating that Jesus Christ, the King, is coming as our Savior. Um, and this, this verse um, shows up in the catacombs. You've seen this fish, Christian fish. Um, now, in our day and age, you see a Christian fish and there's not the words. Usually the words are not in here. But this is how Christians in the catacombs, during the time of Mark, um, they would meet in the catacombs because that's where they could avoid persecution because the Roman guards wouldn't want to come. They were very superstitious, didn't want to, as I understand. They didn't want to come down the catacombs. So they would mark, they would mark um, the ichthus. That's what this, you've probably heard of ichthus before. But that's, that's what this is. It's um, I, um, we would say X, the theos. Um, anyway, you go to the different Greek letters, and this is the Greek words. So it's Jesus Christ, God's, Son, Savior. That's the gospel. That's where it comes from. Um, so when you see a Christian fish, it usually doesn't have those things in it, but that's where it comes from. It's a pronouncement, a pronouncement or proclamation of who Jesus Christ was. Cool. And it was sort of a, a code because, remember, Romans didn't read Greek. They read Latin. So this was sort of just some symbol that was put superstitiously up here. So even if the Roman guards did come down, they wouldn't know that this is where the Christians met. And so they would put this, on, as I understand, outside of houses, um, on some of their, uh, their jewelry that they had. They would mark themselves as Christians so you, other people could see that they were Christian. Um, and they would put it in a spot where they would meet in the catacombs. And it comes really, um, not really from one place, but I find it interesting that this, understanding what gospel means and reading this one verse here of Mark 1.1 1, 1, um, in the Greek, it almost follows that exactly, right? Um, which I thought was kind of neat. I like seeing things like that, you know, the, like where stuff comes from. So in the last few minutes, we've got um, Mark is saying there's, there's the beginning of good news. In essence, what he's saying, if I would, I would take what we understand about gospel and put it in our own language, I would say, here's the beginning of good news for all mankind who would bring salvation. This is what he's saying. Um, 
So it was into this culture that he wrote. He wrote this. Now, Jesus Christ, um, most people see this as Jesus' first and last name. And that's not the case. Christ is the title. Jesus is his name. And uh, quite frankly, Jesus wasn't technically his name. Joshua was his name. I don't know if you know this. But uh, there's, uh, we've been through this. We went through Matthew. But um, you know that his name was Yeshua. Yeshua was Yahshua. 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 Um, and it means Yahweh saves. But because there's other Joshua's in the New Testament, they wanted to delineate between, because it was all capital letters. There wasn't any uppercase, lowercase to say, here is God, capital G, and lowercase g. So they wanted to identify between Jesus or, or Joshua, the Joshua, and Joshua, right? So, so when they translated into, um, um, into Greek, I, um, I don't know how to say this, Iusu or something like that, that was his name in Greek. But in Latin... Um, it was translated into, I mean, when it went from Latin to English, it became Jesus. And so rather than changing it back to Joshua, when they started going back to the Greek, because it, it went from Greek to Latin to English, and then eventually all the English people went back to the Greek. But instead of, everybody saw it as Jesus, they didn't change it. So they left it Jesus and the Joshua's were Joshua. But his name was Yeshua. And, um, and you see that in Matthew, um, where is it? In Matthew 121, remember what the angel said to Joseph? He said, and you shall call his name Yeshua. And remember what he said after that? For he will save his people from their sins. That's exactly what Joshua means. Yeshua saves, or Yahweh, sorry, Yahweh, Yahweh saves. So he was named Yeshua, or Joshua, which means Yahweh saves. Um, so so that, that was the first name. The second, go ahead. Sometimes the Bible pray Yeshua Hamashiach. Hamashiach, Yeshua, Hamashiach. Yep. yes. Yeshua HaMashiach. Yes. That's a good uh, Michael Card song, actually. A oh. song about that, if anybody knows Michael Card. But, um, HaMashiach was the uh, Messiah, okay. or Christ, the anointed one. And that's the second name, which is Christ, which means anointed one. And in the Jewish tradition, only two people were anointed that were king and a priest. Those were only two people that, by office, they were anointed. So he was, um, he was the anointed one, which was a kingly title. So it's Jesus Christ. Jesus the King, in essence, is what it's saying. Jesus the King, the appointed one, the chosen one. Um, it carried a lot more than just king. Um, it meant he was chosen by God to be a king. It wasn't just he was born a king as he was appointed or he was anointed as a king. And, of course, we know from Hebrews and studying Hebrews that he was a priest as well, uh, which I think is kind of cool to see. But Jesus the anointed one. Um, so when people use that name in vain, they're actually, they don't know it, but they're really making a proclamation that Jesus is king. That's what, that's what, it's not, they're not using his first and last name in vain. They're saying his first name, which is Yahweh saves, is the king. Mm -hmm. And, or you could say priest if you pull in um, Hebrew as well. So um, I've had some fun with that with people who use the name. And it really bothers me. And I always yeah. like to tweak them a little bit and says, do you believe Jesus is the king too? And they're like, what are you talking about? I said, well, you yeah. said Jesus Christ. That's what Christ <coughs> means is he's the king. <laughs> I believe that. <laughs> And they're like, they're like really weirded out by it. Yeah. So they tend not to say it anymore because I always poke them and that's how I get them not to use yeah. his name in vain. But anyway, um, so the, lastly in verse one, the son of God, this is one of Mark's favorite titles for Jesus. Um, I believe also Luke's as well. Um, I believe he's saying here that Jesus was God. He's co-equal in essence with God, the father. Um, the first sentence of this chapter announces the beginning of the good news, which is the king is coming and he's bringing salvation um, and he's the son of God, uh, co-equal with God the Father. Um, he, he's, when, you, when we look next week at the prophecy that he talks about, he's going to, and we'll, we'll get through, um, um, I thought we would get through, we start a little bit late today, but we'll get through the rest of it. But the prophecy, if you look closely at the prophecy, if you want to cross-pollinate or kind of look at where they come from, you probably can see in your notes, but um, he says it comes from Isaiah. And this was a common thing. You could put a bunch of quotes together and you would choose the greatest person that was the quotes and said it's from Isaiah the prophet. It's actually from Malachi. Uh, Malachi uh, 3.1. Uh, to write this down. Yeah, yeah Malachi 3.1 and Isaiah 43. Um, not 43, but 40, chapter 40, verse 3. And by the way, Isaiah 40 is a really, really good book if you want to study the prediction of Jesus Christ and the Messiah and what he would do. But pay close attention, especially in Malachi 3.1, pay close attention to the pronouns and see who's talking. There's three people. Um, and when you get here, there's two people. 
And uh, three people in Malachi are God the Father, God the Son, and the messenger that's coming, not named. In here, you have God and you have the messenger. And I think that's interesting that you have God the Father and God the Son, and here you just have God. And the person who's speaking is they saying, I'm sending it for you and yours. So it really, it's replacing God the Father and God the Son, and they're kind of in one person now. And the person who's coming, it's really interesting how he does this. And it follows right after the Son of God. Um, so you see this Messiah. It's a, it's a prediction that God is coming, he's going to save you. But here, um, God, who is coming, is going to save you now is Jesus Christ. Uh, so it's a, it's a really, I think, a beautiful picture of that Jesus is God. He's not just the Son of God, which he is. He is God, co-equal with God the Father. It's really, you have to pay close attention to it, but uh, those who were Jewish would have seen this. Those who were Roman, if they went to go back and look at the prophecy, maybe some Jewish Romans, they would have seen this. Um, so I'll, I'll, leave, I'll leave that there. So this is good news, but remember the good news is the king is coming and he's bringing salvation. If, you're, if you've got your ancient hat on and you're thinking the way they would have thought or they would have understood this word gospel, the technical meaning of the gospel is what Mark was announcing is that, that the, the king is coming and he's bringing salvation with them and he's none other than the son of God. And he pulls on these prophecies that predicts that God is coming to save his people. Um, and you add that to what the angel said to Joseph, you shall call his name... Yeshua, uh, which by the way means Yahweh saves, God saves, yet this is God. And you see, the, see how it all overlaps? Um, because he will save his people from their sins. And those, those pronouns are super important because I count myself as his people and he saved me from my sins. Uh, it's a very personal statement. It's not a general statement. It's a very specific statement he's making. So you layer all the stuff together and this first couple of verses are just exciting. I mean, if I was a suffering Christian, I see this announcement. I want to read the rest of what Mark says. And uh, if you have a chance, just, you know, Mark doesn't take that long to read. Through. It's only 16 chapters, and it reads pretty quickly. It's a, it's, it's a pretty quick read. It's not dense at all. It's very, very easy to read. So any comments on that before we go to prayer? Yeah, just one. In my opinion, the name is important. Like you said, I think a lot of people today believe his name is Jesus Christ, like that is his last name. But there was an article in JAMA, Journal of American Medical Association, about 25 or 30 years ago, that brought more controversy than any other at the time. And there were done more letters to the editor. And it was titled, On the Physical Death of Jesus Christ. And they went I've heard about that. Talking about, uh, you know, where the nails would have been, exsanguination, the spear in the side, that sort of thing. That wasn't the controversy. The controversy was the title, Jesus Christ. And there were so many Jewish <clears throat> doctors that wrote in and mm -hmm. said he is not the Messiah. Mm -hmm. he is, yeah, it was. So better. they knew. They knew better. They knew what that yeah. meant. <laughs> and and uh, on that point, um, when you read the Gospels, pay attention to how the um, the leaders respond. A lot of people will say Jesus never said he was God, oh. but look at how many times the Jews tried to tried yeah. to stone him because he said he was God. <laughs> yes. exactly. They understood what he was saying. And so you look at the responses, and I say, hey, absolutely did. I'm sure. so much so that he died for it. Yeah. He revealed it to Pilate, didn't he? Yes, I mean, he did. <laughs> you said no. Well. Yeah, as you say. As you say. <laughs> you were talking about Aramic? That's yes. not the same as Aramaic? I think it's the same. I was saying Aramaic as in it's Arama <gasps> Aramaic is what I speak, but that person speaks Aramaic. It's like we're talking about uh, part of Daniel's written in Aramaic. Yes, it is. Chaldeans, the, yep. the language. Yeah, Aramaic, as I understand, I'm not a linguist here, but I understand was it came from Babylon. It was sort of a mixture of Jewish and Babylonian, and that's they, they brought it back. And they actually had translations in Aramaic, but Daniel, I think the second half is written in Aramaic. It's, it's the only non. Chapter 2 to part of chapter 7. There you go. Yeah. Which was also, to the Gentiles. This is at least the third time you've asked me. You know what? Do you know what this means? I always forget. So just now I thought, okay, witness that looks like this W. Oh, there you means go. Means martyr. There you go. Witness martyr. Means an M martyr. That's so right. Maybe next time I'll remember. That's maybe. right. <laughs> I, I, that's why I have to write stuff down because I forget. So I, I study this stuff and it's new to me every time, even though I probably said it before. So thank you for bearing with me. <laughs> One thing that uh, hurts my heart is that there are Jews 
over the ages or yeah. whatever that they don't believe that their Messiah has come. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I don't see how they don't see the truth of it. And mm-hmm. it breaks my heart that <coughs> to this day, yeah. there are Jews that are waiting for the Messiah. And they, they missed him, and that was like... There's, there's a Christian uh, Jew named Amir Sarfati. I don't know if you guys have seen him. He's a really... Uh, the whole Israel. Yeah, he does the, the whole Israel thing. And he says that a lot of the... Jews have this thing of like, well, we're we're the people of God, and they, they choose their their race as the identity of being chosen by God, and that's all they need, and they, so they don't acknowledge Jesus at all. Right. Oh, they well, Paul, <laughs> Paul, who obviously was a Jew, um, he he said, I think Jesus it's in Romans thirteen. Yeah. He said, um, if I could give up my salvation for my brothers, I would. That's how much he, he pained that they would be saved. He said, I can't do it, but if I could, I would do it. Mm. I mean, think about the depths of that. Mm. I, would, I would suffer eternally so my brothers could be saved. Mm. I mean, that's how much he cared. <coughs> I mean, it's a challenge. Do you, do you feel like that of people, of your friends? Mm. You know, yeah. it's convicting. That's very convicting. That we don't. Very convicting. Because he, he did, and he, not that he could, but he wanted to. He had a strong desire to. And he prayed with tears. You know, God, please save them. But, yeah. Yeah, we, we, we're, a, we're Christians, but we're a Jewish. Uh, we serve a Jewish Messiah. We, we will uh, serve a Jewish king. Um, you know, in the, in the kingdom, there's going to be tribes. There's going to be a temple. I don't fully understand how that works. But Ezekiel and, uh, and Isaiah, the end, talk, talk about it. Um, and so... So it's a, it's a people that I love. It's a, it's a religion that I feel for, but there's nothing special about the Jewish missing it because we as human beings miss it all the time. We want to have works to get to God, just like the Jews. By, they, they, were, they, were, uh, they believed either in salvation by surgery, which is circumcision, or salvation by works, which was the law, and uh, though both of those together. And there's nothing new in religion. Um, say, Satan's best work is done in religion. It's not done in witchcraft and things like that. Behind every false religion and false teacher are demons. That's his best work. Um, his best work is the, the broad road doesn't say this way to hell. The broad road says this way to heaven. Mm-hmm. And many people follow it not understanding He's because he's blinded them to it. Mm-hmm. Oh. oh, sorry. No, another thing that, that makes my heart sick is that I was... When I was younger, I was raised a uh, Catholic, and I'm not saying anything about the Catholic religion. I know it's based on Jesus and all that, but they took their eyes away from it by praying to St. Christopher. Yes, and angels and the glorification of Mary and all that. You know, it's like they just took your eyes off of Jesus. Jesus might have been a statue up in the front, and there was a... There was a cross, but Mary's statue was there, and so was, you know, and it was, it, that sickens me too, that, yeah. not that it's, that they don't believe in Jesus Christ, but they take your mind off of him. Right. Well, I'll, um, you may not say it, but I, I will say this, and I'll go to prayer, because our, our time is up, but um, Paul, Paul, in fact, I'll just quote Paul. He said, if anybody else adds to this gospel, gospel of grace, mm-hmm. by faith alone, and that's it, yeah. um, let him be accursed. And so any religion that claims to be Christian that adds anything to it, they're an anathema. They give anathemas to other people, but Paul says you are an anathema uh, because you're adding to the gospel. As well-intentioned as they are, and even though people get saved in spite of it, um, it's a dangerous, dangerous thing. And well, Paul as, speaks as a strongly. Girl, a little girl growing up, I was uh, encouraged to pray to Mary. Yeah. And Mary would ask her son. And, you know, and that seemed to make Jesus sense. Jesus doesn't have time for you. Jesus is too busy, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for these, uh, these words. We thank you for the time that we got to spend in your word. We look forward to learning more about you and being reminded of, of your life and your deeds and your teachings through the eyes of, uh, of Peter, through Mark, uh, most likely. We, we thank you for this testimony. We pray that we would be faithful to what we learn and we'd be looking for ways that we can become more like your son. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. Amen.